Once upon a time, there lived the greatest hero we've ever known. He was brought up by the wise wizard Merlin. He became king of the Britons when he pulled the sword from the stone. He married the beautiful Guinevere. He rode out of Camelot, protected from harm by his magic sword Excalibur. He sat in council with the chivalrous knights of the Round Table and sent them to find the Holy Grail. But, as all heroes will be, he was betrayed. First by the brave Lancelot, who fell in love with Guinevere, and then by his sister, who persuaded him to fight without Excalibur. Mortally wounded in battle with his treacherous son, his body was carried to the Isle of Avalon, from where it said, in our hour of greatest need, one day he'll rise again. This king was called Arthur, and his story is known to us all. But actually, he's shrouded in mystery. Some people say that he was a chivalrous medieval king, others a gritty Dark Age warrior, others again that he never existed at all. Time Team are setting out on a quest of our own to see if we can find out who he really was. This is Camelot. It's a theme park in Lancashire. Every year, 400,000 visitors come here to experience the romantic and chivalric world of King Arthur. And this is how we, in the 21st century, remember him, a medieval king. It's an image that's endured for hundreds of years. But is it true? Tintagel Castle in Cornwall is the most famous Arthurian landmark in the country. It's thought by many to be where Arthur was actually born. but only because a Victorian poet said so. In the 1880s, Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote an epic poem about Arthur called The Idylls of the King. In it, he describes Arthur's conception in Tintagel Castle and his rather unusual birth on the beach below. And down the wave, and in the flame was born a naked babe, and rode to Merlin's feet, who stooped and caught the babe and cried, The King! Here is an heir for Uther! With the usual cast of characters, lots of chivalry, lots of romance and a smattering of magic, Tennyson tells the Arthur story pretty much as we know it today. We have a version of Arthur's birth. We have a version of the sword in the stone. We have Merlin as a figure who is guarding Arthur. We have Arthur falling in love with Guinevere and then of course he shows very powerfully Arthur's death. The last battle is absolutely superb. The core of Tennyson's Arthur is of course chivalric. It, he's a knightly figure with the knightly virtues as the Victorians imagined them. And they didn't have to imagine too hard. Tennyson and his friends brought the medieval hero to life with a bizarre photographic record of some of the key scenes. It was easy to forget that there were no cameras in the Middle Ages and to believe in this Arthur and his birthplace. There was no surviving folklore about Arthur at Tintagel until Tennyson wrote about it. And Tennyson put Arthurian tourist sites on the map. It was the age of the railway. People flocked to see Tintagel. Arthur as a tourist attraction was created by Tennyson. This is what they came to see. The ruins of Tintagel Castle, seat of King Arthur. You can almost hear the clatter of knights' hooves, <laughs> can't Absolutely. you? Absolutely. 
Tennyson talks about this as being Arthur's birthplace, and it's the most fantastic vista of castle there. What kind of castle was it? Well, this is a very large castle, actually. We're standing in the outer courtyard here and beyond us, and above us almost, is another uh, ward up there. Between here and the other side where the land has gone would have been other buildings, and then there you've got the hall and the inner courtyard. How many people might have lived in it? Almost certainly hundreds of people in relation to the ruler. So it's pretty spectacular. Did Arthur live here? I'm sorry, it's not Arthur's birthplace and it's not his castle either. It's how, how do you say that so definitely? Because this is a 13th century castle. Ah. The problem is that the real historical Arthur wasn't a medieval king and so couldn't have lived in a 13th century castle. Tennyson was peddling a myth. Tennyson was drawing his material from books which portrayed Arthur as a medieval king, and it's actually deceptively historical, because it's a very good portrait of what a medieval king was like and how he operated. But in fact, the real historical Arthur is 5th, 6th century, and we know very little about his cultural background, and therefore it's very easy to overlay the figure of the medieval king onto this rather nebulous 5th century figure. Which is exactly what Tennyson did. He'd probably have called it poetic license. And there was a lot of artistic license going on as well. Victorian painters went mad on Arthur, and they too cast him as a medieval king as McAston discovered in the library of the Oxford Union. It's a complete set of paintings of the history of Arthur, and you have the wedding of Arthur and Guinevere, yeah. and the adventure of the White Hart, which is the leaping figure. Then you have Lancelot and the Holy Grail. Lancelot fails in the quest of the Holy Grail because of his love for Guinevere, and a very familiar image at the end the hand with the sword rising out of the water, and that, of course, is Excalibur. Yeah. How widespread was this view of, of Arthur as a romantic figure? Is it, is it just in Oxford? No, it's everywhere. They loved the Arthurian theme. You get sculptures, you get it, of course, slightly earlier in the Queen's robing room in the House of Lords. It was a really general uh, artistic as well as a literary enthusiasm. But the Victorians didn't conjure their Arthur out of thin air. They got him from this, a book that Alfred Tennyson and at least one of the Victorian artists had read as children. It's called The Mort d'Arthur, and it was written by a medieval nobleman called Sir Thomas Mallory 350 years earlier, and he wrote it in there. Gosh, this must have been a grim place 500 years ago. So what had Thomas Mallory done to deserve being banged up in here? He seems to have done a little bit of everything. He was in prison for much of the 1450s because he tried to murder the Duke of Buckingham. He, uh, <laughs> he was a cattle thief, uh, a rapist, uh, a robber. As well as being a serial criminal, Mallory was a scholar and an Arthur obsessive. And with plenty of time on his hands, he began to write an Arthurian blockbuster. He takes the whole story from Arthur's birth to Arthur's end and puts it together in English. He's the first person in English to do that. So we have um, Arthur's upbringing, we have the involvement of Merlin, we have the drawing the sword from the stone, um, we have Excalibur, the Lady of the Lake, the love affair between Lancelot and Guinevere, the quest for the Holy Grail, all of those elements. Are, are in Mallory. And like Tennyson after him, he lifts Arthur out of the Dark Ages and repackages him as the medieval monarch we know today. Mallory's knights are very much knights of the, of the late Middle Ages. They wear sort of full armor. Um, and uh, and he, the, the emphasis on jousting and tournaments, it's all, it all belongs more to Mallory's period than to, than to an earlier period. Mallory's Mort d'Arthur quickly became the number one bestseller in Tudor England. Caxton had just invented the printing press, and it was one of his first publications. Which meant not just that it was widely read at the time, but for
The question is, where did Mallory get his inspiration? And the answer lies 300 years further back in the past and about five hours by ferry over there. Join me after the break as I continue my search for Arthur, King of the Britons, in France. Some people say that this is the real home of King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table, and that 800 years ago, this forest rang to the clash of steel on steel, the screams of damsels in distress, and the pounding of hooves as Arthur's knights went about their chivalric deeds. It certainly feels pretty Arthurian. I find it hard to believe that the forest of Brocéliande in the heart of Brittany is the home of the real Arthur. But a mythical Arthur has left some bizarre footprints here. These locals may tell you are the remains of Camelot. And this, the Valley of No Return, where Arthur's sister Morgana held adulterous knights captive. And what about this? To my untutored eye, this thing here looks like the remains of a Bronze Age burial mound. But, tied to it, you've got a little teddy, like something you might see outside Kensington Gardens. And there's a big crack here, which is jammed full of little bits of writing. And round here, you've got something out of the Blair Witch Project. What's going on here? This place is, uh, is called Le Tombeau de Merlin, which is Merlin's grave. And today a lot of people from everywhere come here to ask some help from Merlin. They give him some presents, uh, a shell for instance, or a ribbon. They write exactly their wish. So for instance you have one here, which is in Spanish. This one is in French, it's a young boy. What's he, asked, he asking for? Yes, he's asking for to be the more handsome and to work very well all, all his life long. Why did you bring me to this little stream? Because it was it's especially a wonderful place. For the first time, Lancelot and the Queen Guinevere met alone. And the place hide their secret love. So they made love here, Lancelot Maybe and Guinevere? Maybe, it said. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> So how did Arthur and his knights find themselves uprooted from Britain to a forest in France? The answer probably lies with the Crusaders in the 11th century. They carried with them from Britain stories of Arthur and spread them across Europe on their way to the Holy Land. They could easily have faded from memory were it not for two French writers, Robert Wass and Chrétien de Troyes, who took the legends and transformed them into a new literary phenomenon, the first romantic novels. Chrétien de Troyes was writing for um, powerful patrons and he produced five romances uh, which uh, were copied, which were imitated, uh, to such an extent that you can say that the Arthurian romance after Chrétien de Troyes uh, was to become possibly one of the most popular literary genres for centuries to come. The setting for many of these prototype Mills and Boone novels was the enchanted forest of Brocéliande. And the Arthur they placed there is instantly recognisable. He's the medieval king with his chivalric knights of the round table. Everything starts with Arthur, everything ends with Arthur. There is a general theme as well of a certain ideal of chivalry. Knights go out, they belong to, uh, to a social unit that has uh, a certain ideal. This ideal is one which is beneficial to society. In this guise, Arthur and his knights are a French invention. And so too are many of the trimmings we most associate with the legend. The romantic hero Lancelot, his adulterous romp with Guinevere, 
the round, round table, table. Uh, some names also, like Excalibur or Camelot, some, uh, the Grail, the Grail, all the story of the Grail, the knight like Perceval, the one who is seeking for the Grail. It, it's, all that comes from the French, uh, the French writers. So most of the story, really? The, mainly the shape of the story we know today, yes. It was this French story that Mallory and Tennyson after him used to create the Arthur so familiar to us today. But he's a fictional character, not the real Arthur of 5th and 6th century history. To find him, we must follow a new trail. And it leads to a reassuringly British city. Around about the same time as the French authors were writing down the European versions of Arthur, here in Oxford, a Welsh historian called Geoffrey of Monmouth was writing down the British version. But his was very different to any that we've come across so far. His Arthur appeared to be real. Geoffrey wrote a book called The History of the Kings of Britain. Note the Britain, because it actually is about Welsh, British history. Arthur fits into it as a climax of the history, the moment when the Welsh achieve a huge empire which was ruled by Arthur. It's the moment of glory for the Welsh. It's the climax of his history. In this telling, Arthur doesn't waste his time with jousts and dragons. He's a warrior. He defeats the Saxons and soon becomes an ambitious and aggressive conqueror of territory. Arthur goes on, marches his army through France, defeats the Roman armies. He almost conquers the Roman Empire but even before he attacks the Romans he's already conquered all the sort of kingdoms surrounding the North Sea and uh, anybody else in sight. In 12th century Britain this was dynamite. Forget the hero of romantic fiction, Geoffrey's imperial ruler had real political power. The essence of Geoffrey isn't so much in what he said as in the manner in which he said it. The historical manner with all the apparatus, formal use of Latin, uh, dating, cross-dating with known events, it smells of history. And that's what gave people the conviction thereafter that Arthur had been a real historical figure. The political implications of that status of Arthur, of course, was that all English kings hereafter could claim Arthur as part of the foundation of their dynasty. They didn't have to worry too much about where do we come from and who was here before us, particularly people like the Normans, who of course were incomers and had no claim to national history whatsoever. As soon as they could connect themselves with Arthur, they had a, a past to fall back upon. In other words, Arthur became a very powerful propaganda tool. To give their claim some substance, the Normans needed some Arthurian reality, and they found it here. Even today, Glastonbury trades successfully on its reputation as Arthur's final resting place. But the story begins 800 years ago. After a tip-off from the king, Henry II, the local monks began an excavation in the Abbey Cemetery. It was miraculously successful. What's this? Site of the ancient graveyard where in 1191 the monks dug to find the tombs of Arthur and Guinevere. How did 12th century monks know <laughs> that it was Arthur and Guinevere? I mean, they wouldn't have had carbon date. No, 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 that's right. Well, I mean, the debate really is whether they would have recognised one was a male and one was a female, because that's quite a specialised job. Uh, they said that Arthur's bones were very large, and they thought that's what you, you know, a chap like him would have been like, and they found some hair surviving, some blonde hair of Guinevere. But more importantly, they found a lead cross, which uh, said something like, here lies Arthur in the Isle of Avalon. But, of course, people who've looked at that have said, well, the lettering's all wrong for that date and everything else. It's, it's clearly a, you know, a forgery. So this and is a wind-up, isn't it? Well, that's hope. right. But, I mean, and then the reason it's quite interesting, you see, because it's also at the time when we know that Henry II uh, is very anxious to legitimise his reign. And, and uh, what better than to link himself with the, the great hero? And more importantly, perhaps, show that he's not lying somewhere await, waiting to rise and defend the Britons, but he's actually buried at Glastonbury. He's buried on Henry's territory, if you like. 
And Henry's French, uh, and so if he can demonstrate that his antecedents is uh, an ancient English king, it kind of legitimises him being here. I can't believe that the chaps actually doing it thought that they were involved in some con trick. But Henry's spin doctors probably did. It's, it's one of the first big hoaxes, big archaeological hoaxes. Arthur's propaganda value wasn't lost on Henry's successors either. One of them even claimed to have discovered the original round table, now hanging in the Great Hall in Winchester. But that doesn't go back to the, the 500s, does it? No. And what date does it date from? Then? Well, it's been dated by uh, tree rings. Oh, dendro date? Yeah. Right. And that puts it about 1275, plus or minus 15. So, so say... Edward I. Edward I. Right? So yeah. wh why did Edward I want to make a round table, then? Well, Edward I wanted to attach himself to the reputation of Arthur, king of whole of Western Europe, more or less, great uh, champion of right. the British, yeah. and so he builds an imitation round table, holds periodic assemblies, gets the boys oh. together, yeah. and says, look, descendant of, great, of, of, of Arthur. And did, did the other medieval kings feel the same about Arthur? Did they like to identify with him? Indeed. Once the, the uh, Edward I had got it started, everybody used it to say, as Edward III did, I am the peak of chivalry. Right. Uh, my yeah. uh, chief knights are the supporters of my kingdom and of me. And every so often I get them together to take counsel. We sit round a round table. We hold tournaments, which are also called round tables. And this is emblematic of the British nation. Where does the Tudor Rose come in then? Because ah. that's a lot later on, isn't it? <laughs> because the Tudors got in on the Arthurian Act as early as they could. You remember they came to power as a result of a revolution. Mm -hmm. So uh, saying, um, we are Welsh, uh, yes, therefore, and Arthur, of course, was Welsh, was a Celt. Yeah. They attached themselves to, uh, to Arthur in that way. Henry VII called his eldest son Arthur, yes. died mm -hmm. early, of course. Yeah. Uh, Henry VIII had the table repainted, right. put the Tudor rose in the middle, and said, Tudors equal Arthur. Geoffrey's Historia had fueled royal propaganda for 300 years. But was it true? Was his historical conqueror any more real than the mythical Arthur of medieval romance? It would be very dangerous to rely on him at all. You might find the trace of something which he picked up in Wales from a manuscript from a source which we no longer have, but it's extraordinarily difficult because he's so inventive and so plausible to unscramble when he's telling the truth and when he's inventing the truth. Can archaeology help us to track him down instead? There is one... Wales. Medieval historians identified it as the scene of Arthur's coronation, and for years this Roman amphitheatre was actually thought to be the round table where Arthur held his councils of war. That's since been discredited, but on the other side of the town is an ancient hill fort which some people think is an Arthurian stronghold. Amateur Arthur hunters have long wanted to see an excavation here to test the theory. And at last, a team of archaeologists from the local university has been given permission to dig here for one month. The hill fort looks like a fairly typical Iron Age hill fort. That is a site that probably dates between about 700 BC up to the first century BC or AD. But within the hill fort, we have um, another earthwork, another archaeological feature, which is a smaller enclosure that looks to be later than the Iron Age hill fort. And we suspect, given its similarity to um, post-Roman sites elsewhere in the west of Britain, that this might actually be of post-Roman or Dark Age date. They plan to open three huge trenches in which they hope to find... A central hall, a barn, and one or two additional outbuildings. And you know, you're looking at the, the home of a, a high-status individual. But proving this individual was Arthur is another matter, and not something Josh and Ray believe is possible. Not all archaeologists, however, are so measured. In fact, many have tried very hard to uncover evidence for Arthur's existence. 
In the 1930s, Raleigh Radford dug under the 13th century castle at Tintagel in the hope of finding a 5th century stronghold. He found some structures, but decided they were part of a monastery. Then in the 1960s, a group of archaeologists formed the Camelot Research Committee, dedicated to tracking down Arthur's elusive HQ. Their primary target was Cadbury Castle in Somerset, identified by ancient historical sources as Camelot. It was even marked on the map. The archaeologists unearthed lots of 5th and 6th century artefacts, and they found the ramparts encircling the site had been heavily fortified, and enclosed a number of buildings, including a huge central hall. This was just the kind of place that Arthur, if he existed, would have lived. But the archaeologists couldn't find a trace of the man himself. We're using archaeology, or at least some people, I wouldn't do it myself, are using archaeology to answer historical questions. Because archaeological methods are very good at picking up something like, I don't know, the Second World War. Some big event. Yes, they'll pick that up. But not individuals, and I, I get very suspicious of that. I mean, you're, you're going to end up with, with, with a teacup that says Arthur was here. You know. It wasn't a teacup, but it was pretty close. Two years ago, a team from Glasgow University were excavating at Tintagel. They began to uncover evidence that the 5th century remains were much grander than a mere monastery. Now, why are you so excited about this ditch? It looks to me just like a standard castle moat. Yes, well, that's what it appears like, doesn't it? But I think, in fact, what we have shown in the last excavation, which in some ways is the most exciting we've had, is that this is not with the castle. Although it's next to the castle walls, and we've got castle walls above us here, this massive ditch here, I think, is almost certainly from the 5th and 6th centuries. How do you know that? We know it because when we excavated last year, and it was probably one of the most exciting things we've done on this site, we found 5th and 6th century pottery in the primary silting of the ditch. Why did they need such a big ditch? Well, I think they needed it because of the nature of the site that it was, because I think, probably, it was a royal stronghold. Suddenly, everyone began to wonder whether Arthur might not have been here after all. And then they found something astonishing. They found a stone with an inscription. And what the stone actually says is, uh, that the father of a descendant of Col made this, and the father's name is Ofnu. Here, apparently, was Francis Pryor's teacup, and it rapidly became proof positive that not only was Arthur a real person, but that he'd lived at Tintagel. Is this where you found Arthur's stone? No, it's not in this building. It's actually just outside here where we found the stone. Why didn't they discover it in the 1930s? Well, actually, where you're standing is where they had the spoil heap. And, in fact, the stone was actually here. Tens of thousands of people, I would have thought, say that that is evidence that Arthur lived here. Yeah. Are they right? I'm afraid they're not, because the stone doesn't say Arthur in the first place. It's got the three letters A, R and T, but they're from the name Arthnu, not the name Arthur. Well, it's pretty close. Well, it may be close, but it's not the same. It's like Edward and Edwin. The ED doesn't make it the same word. So, no dice. Though the romantics among us are relieved Tintagel's once again a possible Arthurian location. If it was huge and fortified in 5th or 6th century, then it could have been Arthur's stronghold. If Arthur was here. It could have been Camelot. If Arthur was here. Do we have any evidence of his presence? I don't think we have. Do we have any evidence that he wasn't here? I think we can show that it's from that period. I don't think we can prove it either way, because actually we know so little about Arthur here at Tintagel. Of course he was here. I can smell him. <laughs> but there's not a whiff of him at Kyalian. After three weeks of hard digging, Josh and Ray and the team at Lodge Hill have shifted an impressive amount of dirt and they've uncovered lots of Iron Age archaeology. But Arthur has once again proved elusive. We have a few small fragments here, not very exciting, but enough to indicate that we have 
late Roman activity on the site. Three tiny little pieces isn't much of an assembly for three weeks' work, is it? No, it isn't, and uh, the pottery may not even represent Dark Age activity. Is this the amount that you would expect to find on a Dark Age site, then? In certain circumstances, you, you, you may um, be in a situation where you don't come across any finds. Certainly in the west of Britain, uh, we know that pottery production ceases at the, the, the end of the Roman period, and we can often only identify uh, Dark Age sites through the presence of imported Mediterranean pottery. Is this Camelot? I wouldn't have said so. We've drawn a blank on the archaeology. But join us after the break as we finally track down the real King Arthur and work out how he might have pulled the sword from the stone. 1150 right now. I need more gloves. ancient Welsh. This is the White Book of Hrotherch and it contains what is probably the earliest extant Welsh Arthurian tale or indeed any full Arthurian tale. Yeah. It's the story of Cilch and Olwen, oh, yes. uh, Cilch the young hero searching for the giant's daughter Olwen and he comes to Arthur's court uh, to seek Arthur's assistance. Ac ydyfu glywlwyd i'r neuadd amcawd Arthur wrth ddaw nos honno hyd y llall hyd ymhen yn flwyddyn Arthur appears in three or four different Welsh legendary poems, all written sometime after the 8th century. They paint a picture of a powerful king who inhabits a strictly mythical world. He rids the land of monsters, he fights with giants, um, he releases prisoners from the other world. These are the sorts of pictures of Arthur that come out from Welsh legend. This character is not himself historical. The question is, was he based on someone who was? If so, he'd have lived in the Dark Ages, which begin when the Roman army leaves Britain in the fifth century. The Saxons invade and occupy most of what we now call England. They get as far as the borders of Wales, Cornwall and Scotland, where they meet fierce resistance from the native Britons, one of whom may have been called Arthur. The name appears in two ancient Celtic histories which describe these events. One is the Annales Cambriae, the Annals of Wales, written in the 9th century. I suppose the crucial references, because they have dates to them, uh, one is the Battle of Baden Hill, which is 518, and then there's the other Battle of Camelon, which became one of the great legendary battles, because that's where Arthur died. So they do refer to Arthur at particular times and at particular places. Arthur also appears in the Historia Britonum, the history of the Britons, written by someone called Nennius, also in the 9th century. He does list some 12 battles, which must have stemmed the Saxon advance and was crucial in that sense, so that Nennius seems to have, and his source seems to have, a very clear idea of where Arthur belongs historically. But what's worrying about both texts is that they were written 300 years after the events they describe. And the only contemporary history, written by a monk called Gildas, mentions the battles, but not Arthur. There's several ideas, suggestions why he doesn't refer to Arthur, um, some of them more convincing than others, but the fact is that he doesn't. Um, I'm not terribly exercised by that. Um, to me, if you put the bits of information together, you do get a picture of Baden, which must have been a historical battle. 
the significance of which is the same for Gildas and for Nennius, then you move on and you have a hero in Nennius, uh, and then you have the same hero appearing in the Nihalis Cumbre. So putting them together, I think, we find a figure, let us say a king, a leader, at a particular time in British history, around about the early 6th century, who achieved something very great, uh, something very significant for the time. So, so you are King Arthur. You take me com totally by surprise. I mean, short of the well, without you've got no breastplate and backplate, but the, the crest on the helmet, the cheek pieces, you look exactly like a Roman soldier. If Arthur existed, Phil, then he was a Romano-British nobleman, and consequently he was a mixture of the old Roman influences. I along mean, with English influence. So he you're going to be more Lord Arthur than King Arthur, is that it? We know that a nobleman um, led resistance in the West against the Saxons. We don't know whether he was a king. We don't know whether he still carried a Roman title. A nobleman, certainly. A Romano-British nobleman would have worn equipment like this and would have ridden a horse. How many of your compatriots are also going to be mounted and how many are going to be infantry? Not very many are going to be able to afford the investment in all of this equipment and the time and expense involved in producing a war horse like this. So you've got small groups of mounted knights. I mean, how was it that they were able to hold off all these Saxon invaders for, for a comparatively long time? What they were able to do was to combine mobility and firepower and shock tactics all in one neat package if you like. Saxons would could advance being infantrymen they can hold ground, they can build fortifications but Arthur's men have got the ability to roam all over the countryside and certainly the number and scale of sites associated with them throughout the country indicates that horsemen must have been used to get around all of those places. So this is the real Arthur a very successful Romano-British guerrilla who led a small cavalry war band against the Saxons. Quite different from the Arthur we started with. But Arthur seems to be recreated by each successive generation. So I think for us we would lose the medieval Arthur, we would lose the chivalric Arthur, we would lose the Arthur of shining knights, um, of rescuing maidens. But I think if we are prepared to lose those elements, uh, then we would get back to something much closer to the truth. But our journey doesn't end here. One of the most familiar and enduring images of the legend is Arthur's sword. That could have its roots in the Iron Age, hundreds of years before Arthur lived. Carenza Lewis has gone in search of the real Excalibur, and the trail has led her to a remote Welsh lake. This lake that you can see in front of you is a reservoir which was constructed in about 1911 and there was a small lake here which was drained, uh, deepened, made bigger and lo and behold when the excavations were taking place for the reservoir a number of fantastic artefacts came up, early Iron Age material including swords, axes, cauldrons, various other things. Swords, so that would be like Arthur throwing Excalibur back Absolutely. into the lake. Yes, we've got one wonderful iron sword, very early Iron Age, um, which was deposited here, presumably as a ritual act, about 600 BC. Are they common finds, then, the sort of swords in water? I wouldn't say they were common, they were obviously special, but you do find them repeatedly in lakes, in Wales, in Scotland and Ireland and elsewhere. Clearly a votive act, something very precious, a piece of military hardware, belong to somebody, perhaps a war hero, something like that, very often cast into the lake as a kind of act for the gods. So it's as if the people talking about the Arthur character were remembering ancient, dimly remembered past rituals to put together this myth of Arthur. I would say so. I don't think it's coming out of nothing. I think there is a kind of germ or core of reality and, and, and fact about this, which is then blown up into wonderful sort of episodic stories. But some people think the legend stretches even further back 
than the Iron Age. One image in particular could predate Arthur by thousands of years. Let me put it to you. The sword and the stone. If King Arthur was creating a sword, which is in effect what's happening here. Right, you're talking about actually how you make the sword. I'm, I'm talking about how you make the sword. If he'd been doing it in his own lifetime, then he would have been taking a sword from a rod of iron. He would have beaten it when it was red hot. He would have forged it like a blacksmith. There's nothing here which suggests pulling swords from oh. stones. <laughs> Expert bronze caster Dave Chapman to demonstrate his theory. This is the stone. And the sword is in here. It's almost like to me as though there's some sort of great mythical beast in there that's snoring away. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a dragon or something. Yeah, yeah, he is. He's, he's, he's deep in sleep, but he's down in there somewhere. <laughs> What have we got to get it to? We're looking for 1150, ideally. So it's that final 150 degrees? Yeah. And once we get it there, do we have to hold it, or is it just a matter of getting it there? No, once it's that hot, then we can go for it. Yeah. <laughs> 47.2. 47.3. 4. 5. 6. 8. 9. 49. 49. 11, one degree. 49, one degree to go. 3. 4. four. Five, seven, six, nine, 150. 150. Hey. Right, now. I need my gloves. <laughs> That's pretty bright. I'll take the lid off first. We can. Is it going to come? Yep. Oh, wow. Good, Good Lord, and that's in Roman. It couldn't be Iron Age, it has to be Bronze Age which means that the sword in the stone could be up to 1,500 years older than Arthur. And Francis's theory has another twist to it. Arthur's sword, remember, had a name. The moment of pouring a sword and casting it and then very quickly afterwards drawing it from the stone is a very... Someday someone may find a teacup which really has Arthur's name on it, but until then he'll remain a figure shrouded in mystery. And maybe that's no bad thing, because as each new generation of writers has created their own Arthur out of that mystery, so the legend has developed in richness and colour. And what we're left with is the ultimate romantic hero. The key to romance is the projection of that which we would like to believe, but know perfectly well in our hearts is not true. Romance has as its key word, wouldn't it be wonderful if? And Arthur's political romance is the romance of a past of this island that never was, but it would be wonderful if it had been so. Well, not exactly the Lady of the Lake, but four takes to the water next Sunday at 5.25 with the Wreck Detectives. Then we're creating magic out of bits and pieces in an icy scrap heat challenge at 6.30. Next tonight, the Channel 4 News.